Good morning. I'd like to uh, welcome you all for our conference. Uh, it's time for our next session. I'd like on behalf of all uh, our honorary presidents and organizing committee and our honorable attendees to welcome Professor Dr. Hatum Sulaiman, consultant in cardiothoracic intensive care Harfield Hospital, honorary senior lecturer, School of Cardiovascular Metabolic Medicine, King's College, London, member of board councillor for ECHO, European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging, well known, well known for his contribution in ECHO cardiography applications in ICU. Looking forward to hearing the lecture, sir. Thank you very thank much, you very much um, uh, Professor Batul. Uh, dear uh, colleagues, uh, thank you for having me. It's a great uh, pleasure and honor to be with you. Um, and uh, uh, in this presentation, I'm going to discuss how to implement echocardiography and uh, ultrasound at the point of care beyond echocardiography in the management of uh, cardiac critically ill patients. I have no disclosures. And when I approach a patient in critical care, especially in cardiothoracic critical care, I usually think in matters of perfusion. The first question always in a very unstable patient is how is the perfusion? Is the perfusion adequate or not? And I mean here by, by perfusion, cardiac output. But traditionally, when we used to look at uh, LV systolic function by echocardiography, we used to utilize ejection fraction. But ejection fraction as a parameter is not studied and not validated in critically ill patients because it, uh, it changes with the preload, with afterload, with heart rate. It relies on geometric assumptions, which can cause pitfalls in critically ill patients who uh, often have difficult windows. Uh, and it has limited reproducibility. And also, you will not see ejection fraction in any of the definitions of shock. And to demonstrate that ejection fraction alone could be misleading in cardiac critically ill patients, you could see here these two examples on your left-hand side. This is a transesophageal echo, uh, and patient on your left-hand side has a normal ejection fraction. The LV contractility seems preserved, although this patient was in profound cardiogenic shock. And that's because, as we could see in color Doppler, the patient has acute severe mitral regurgitation. And in this case, it was due to flail mitral leaflet. And here, ejection fraction itself will be uh, un uh, uh, overestimated because of the very low afterload and also because of the back backward flow of blood uh, to the left atrium with ventricular systole instead of the forward flow of blood into the aortic valve. And on your right hand side, you see a completely different patient, again with a transesophageal mid uh, esophageal four chamber view. And you could see here that ejection fraction is very low. However, this patient has very stable hemodynamics and stable cardiac output. And therefore, we need to think differently when we assess patients' systolic function and perfusion in critically ill patients. And we usually uh, perform, in this case, the stroke volume estimation using pulsed wave Doppler. And to do that, you need to obtain the apical five-chamber view, use pulsed wave Doppler at the LVOT, and then estimate the LVOT velocity time integral, which can give us a lot of useful information about perfusion. And the normal uh, range for the velocity time integral, uh, which is a distance, the blood travels across the LVOT, the normal range is between 18 to 22 centimeters. So if you have very low LVOT VTI, like in this case, the VTI is 8.2 centimeter, that's an indicator of profound cardiogenic shock. And if you want to measure uh, stroke volume, you need to also uh, calculate the area of the LVOT, assuming that the LVOT is a cylinder. So if you can calculate the area of the LVOT in the parasternal long axis view, and if you calculate the distance and the length of the cylinder, which is the VTI, then you can obtain the stroke volume, and then you obtain the cardiac output, and then you obtain the cardiac index. But when we use VTI, and we use it very frequently, almost every day in our patient cohort, we need to also use it with, uh, within the clinical context. Because like anything in point-of-care echocardiography, it has to be used 
well within the clinical context and we should not blindly rely on the numbers. And here you can have examples of patients who could have normal VTI. We said the normal is between 18 and 22 centimeters. So a VTI of 20 in a patient with sepsis is not a normal VTI. Because in a patient with sepsis, you would expect much higher VTI because of hyperdynamic circulation. And in a different patient with significant aortic regurgitation, a VTI of 20 is also abnormal because in patients with significant aortic regurgitation, you would expect much higher LVOT VTI because of high end diastolic volume of the left ventricle because of the aortic regurgitation. And on a different note, remember that the equation for stroke volume is not only determined by the VTI, it's also determined by the area of the LVOT. So for a patient with a large LVOT diameter, this can compensate for a smaller VTI, producing the same normal stroke volume. So a VTI of 14 in someone with a, an LVOT diameter of 2.5 uh, or 3 centimeters, that will lead to normal stroke volume. And also finally, that we need to remember that the LVOT VTI itself is not specific for the left ventricle. Uh, in other words, it does not tell me exactly that the left ventricle is limiting cardiac output or the right ventricle is limiting cardiac output. Because if you have isolated right ventricular failure, that will also reduce the LVOT VTI because of the ventricular interdependence. So VTI itself just tells me that the cardiac output of the heart, whether it is the right or left or two chambers are limited. And when we use the LVOT VTI to evaluate shock, to assess for shock, very important to rule out obstruction at the LVOT. Because if you have dynamic obstruction in the LVOT, which is seen frequently in cardiac critical care, uh, you will have overestimation of the LVOT VTI, and that will not represent cardiac output. Because in this case, although you will have a high VTI because of the acceleration across the LVOT, like in this case, you have this late systolic peaking uh, or dagger shaped Zeilchanger. Uh, the shape of the trace by continuous wave Doppler, this is indicative of dynamic obstruction of the LVOT. And also you will have very high velocity, although the patient will be in shock. But this type of shock is an obstructive shock because with systole, the blood flow gets obstructed because of the high velocity across the LVOT. And you have many causes in cardiac critical care, which could predispose to dynamic LVOT obstruction. You have tachycardia, hypovolemia, sepsis, left ventricular hypertrophy, severe anemia, inotropes, patients who underwent mitral valve surgery, patients with concentric left ventricular hypertrophy with a small ventricle, all these factors together will increase the incidence of obstruction. And echocardiography is a game changer in these patients because you will never be able to diagnose the obstruction without echocardiography. And it could also potentially save lives because the management changes dramatically once you identify dynamic LVT obstruction. Because normally in cardiogenic shock, when you identify it by echo, you start inotropes, you give diuretics if possible, you uh, uh, also look at increasing heart rate to improve stroke volume. But in this case, the management is completely the opposite. The management here is to increase the end systolic volume of the left ventricle by giving fluids, by stopping inotropes to relieve the obstruction, by starting vasopressor to increase the afterload, or by even reducing heart rate to relieve the gradient across the LVOT. So if you don't diagnose that, you will continue escalating anotropes and your patient might get deteriorate. And it's not only about the LVOT, you can also see this obstruction at the mid ventricular cavity. And we see this frequently after cardiac surgery, especially as in this case, uh, this is a transgastric short axis view. You have a reduced right ventricular function, which also impairs the filling of the left ventricle. So this is a frequent uh, issue after long bypass where you have right ventricular failure and vasoplegia, which worsens the contractility and make the ventricle hyperdynamic. And also this hyperdynamic ventricle is partly because of the right ventricular failure. And that's very tricky to assess. And also once you identify it by echo, you have to be very cautious 
in optimizing the balance between LV and RV. You should not give so much fluids to help the LV because consequently that will affect the RV function. And on balance, usually we look at improving RV function in this case while monitoring hemodynamics using uh, a cardiac output monitoring. And we use in this case pulmonary artery catheter. And I here brought to you a few examples of how echocardiography could help uh, in different patients uh, in cardiac critical care. 45 years old, pre presented with ARDS, 10 years after mitral valve replacement for a ruptured coat. And you could see that even the simplest echocardiographic modality, which is M mode in this case, can provide useful information. Uh, the patient was seen by one of our fellows and had a trans echo, which did not show obvious mitral regurgitation. However, we were doubtful because there were signs of volume overload in the left ventricle and high left ventricular and diastolic pressure. And this was uh, uh, proved by uh, M mode, which showed reversal of the paradoxical septal motion of the left uh, ventricular uh, septum because this patient had a uh, left bundle branch block. And normally a left bundle branch block, you expect to have reversal uh, or paradoxical septal motion of the interventricular septum. And when you have reversal of this paradoxical septal motion with a patient in uh, left branch block, then you suspect high left ventricular volume. And when we did transesophageal echo, it showed significant paravalvular leakage due to the hissing of the posterior annulus. So even M mode can provide very useful information. And that's another patient, 48 years old, had a PCI to LAD and right coronary artery, was presenting with cardiogenic shock, after the PCI with worsening lactate base deficit, worsening central venous saturation with poor cardiac index, and his LVO TVTI was eight. And although we were escalating the inotropes for this patient, he continued to deteriorate, which was according to the Intermax classification of heart failure, he was Intermax one, crashing and burning. And we needed to act quickly, considering mechanical circulatory support. But if you look, carefully at this two-dimensional echo, apical four chamber, there was a, an artifact or was, maybe there was a mass at the apex, which we were not sure whether this is an artifact or a thrombus. Something was bizarre in this akinetic left ventricular apex. And if this is um, a thrombus, that would preclude the patient from having certain types of mechanical support. And if because this patient has isolated left ventricular failure, he was eligible for impeller, which is a trans-aortic device which sits in the cavity of the LV to offload it. And you can't put the impeller if there is a thrombus. So what we did at the bedside, we did a contrast echo, which immediately ruled out a thrombus in the LV apex, and based on that contrast echo at the point of care, we proceeded for impella implantation for this patient. Another patient, 25 years old, presented with shortness of breath, few weeks after a viral influenza, and had worsening perfusion. Um, and we, unfortunately, so uh, uh, several of these patients recently were presented with flu myocarditis. You could see here that the patient has severe impairment of biventricular function. Also, also, there is noticeable dilatation of ventricular cavities, which indicated that this patient had an underlying chronic condition. So this is probably an acute or chronic cardiomyopathy with a mitral regurgitation, severe impairment of ventricular cavities, and on assessing LVOTVTI clearly patient was in cardiogenic shock, and also on assessing the transmitral flow with pulse wave Doppler, there was a clear suppression of the E-wave. The patient had isolated A-wave, so this A-filling pattern was indicative of very high left ventricular and diastolic pressure. And it's important because it tells us that the stroke volume of this patient is predominantly determined in the filling period by the atrial kick. And that's why we have to make this patient and keep the patient in sinus rhythm. Because while you try to offload the patient, you should not allow the patient to become significantly hypokalemic or hypomagnesemic. Otherwise, if they go into atrial fibrillation, they will profoundly decompensate. And with color M mode and continuous wave Doppler, you see significant 
um, uh, mitral regurgitation, which which has high density in the color in the continuous wave Doppler envelope, which indicates severity. And also you will notice that the peak velocity of mitral regurgitation is almost three meters. So it is significantly less than five to six meters centimeters per second, which indicates severe impairment of left ventricular cavity with prolongation of the systolic time and impairment and reduction of the diastolic filling time. And that diastolic mitral regurgitation is also another indicator of high LVADP. So a lot of information and clues you can get by using Doppler at the bedside to assess shock. So our patient had an impella and also had ECMO, peripheral V ECMO to support the organs, but that increases the afterload of the left ventricle, which is offloaded consequently by the impella. So had the impella. Uh, configuration. And while the patient was the, on the impella, which is that transaortic device crossing across the uh, aortic valve into the LV cavity, started to become very hypoxic. And when we did echo at the bedside, there was a severe mitral regurgitation, which was also associated with bilateral coalescent vertical B lines, which indicates pulmonary edema in this patient. And actually, this was a clue for us to optimize the impeller position because that mitral regurgitation was uh, triggered by the impeller malpositioned encroaching on the anterior mitral leaflet because normally the impeller should be sitting nicely in the cavity of the left ventricle. And when we talk about echo in critical care, it is fundamental to, to, to mention the role of the heart-lung interactions and the effect of positive pressure ventilation on the heart, we know that positive pressure ventilation increases right ventricular afterload and reduces the right ventricular preload. And the summation of both effects will be reduction of LV filling and reduction of cardiac output in preload dependent left ventricles. And most healthy ventricles are preload dependent. But if you have a patient with an afterload dependent left ventricle, like in severely impaired left ventricle, mechanical ventilation might improve cardiac output. And that's the only situation where mechanical ventilation might improve cardiac output in an afterload dependent impaired left ventricle. And that's an example of how mechanical ventilation can cause core pulmonary. Uh, you could see in the left side, apical four chamber view with a significantly dilated right ventricle. And that's a core pulmonary effect with incremental increase of PEEP. You will see reduction of the, the RVOT VTI, which is evaluating the stroke volume of the right heart and also pushing the interventricular septum to the left side with a D-shaped left ventricle. And that is the consequence of the incremental increase of PEEP to only 12 centimeter water. So that's not a very high beep. And you could see the dramatic effect on the heart and hemodynamics, which was also profound, uh, made profound by patient being hypoxic and hypercapnic, which also increases the pulmonary vascular resistance. And you could also by echo evaluate the VA coupling or the right ventricular pulmonary artery coupling by estimating the TAPSI, which was very poor in this case, 0.8 centimeter, and estimating the tricuspid regurgitant peak systolic velocity, which was high, and this led to RVPA uncoupling. And the ratio is normally uh, uh, should not be more than should not be less than 0.31. So the coupling ratio, the relationship should be more than 0.31. And in this case, it was 0.2, which indicated uncoupling between both the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. And also the shape of the RVOT flow by pulsed wave Doppler can tell us about pulmonary vascular resistance. If you have a mid-systolic notch, like what you see on your left-hand side, that indicates a high pulmonary vascular resistance. And once you give uh, uh, inhaled nitric oxide, in this case, you see a resolution of the mid-systolic notch and also improvement in the acceleration time. And this mid-systolic notch uh, also could lead us to further information by estimating the peak velocity of flow before and after the notch. The peak velocity of flow before the notch is, is determined by the compliance of the pulmonary artery, and the peak velocity of flow after the notch is determined by the right ventricular function. So having a smaller peak velocity after the notch correlates with poor survival, as, as shown in the studies, because it indicates poor right ventricular function. 
And this is a fascinating study from Japan, which looked at the shape of the RVOT envelope, and they found that the reduction of the post-notch peak velocity was associated with increased mortality and reduced survival in patients with pulmonary hypertension. So the second half is, uh, or second part of the lecture is a smaller part, but it's a very important part. Once I determine perfusion and optimize it by echo, I look at congestion. And our traditional congestion parameters by echocardiography are the use of pulsed wave Doppler and tissue Doppler to estimate the left-sided filling pressures. And using the NEGA formula, we could estimate pulmonary capillary wedge pressure by estimating the E wave velocity uh, and the E prime velocity, which is the relaxation uh, velocity of the mitral annulus in diastole. And this could tell us about pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. However, there are many different pitfalls and my recommendation is to use it again cautiously, knowing the pitfalls of each single parameter. And in some conditions, you might have very high left ventricular end diastolic pressure with normal E over E prime. So you have to individually analyze every parameter together because they are not validated yet in critically ill patients. And using lung ultrasound is very useful from my perspective because it adds to my echocardiographic assessment of congestion. And you could see here on your left-hand side, normal dry lungs and no congestion with these horizontal A-lines, uh, which are reverberations of the pleura. And on your right-hand side, you could see the pattern of congestion with vertical B-lines, which indicates pulmonary edema. And we recently had this uh, clinical consensus document published by the European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging, which includes uh, different uh, guidance uh, algorithms for the use of lung ultrasound in acute and chronic heart failure, including cardiogenic shock. And when we combine echocardiography with lung ultrasound, we have better ability to enhance the assessment of hemodynamic instability at the bedside. You have here four different types of shock. At the top, a patient with septic shock, vasoplegia, hyperdynamic left ventricle, a vegetation in the mitral valve, and a big consolidation in the lung. The panel B is a patient with cardiogenic shock with severely impaired ventricles, dilated IVC, and B lines in the lungs. Panel C is a patient with obstructive shock with D-shaped left ventricle due to RV pressure overload, A-lines in the lungs, and a clot in the common femoral vein. And finally, panel D, a patient with hypovolemic shock, small hypercontractile ventricles, A-lines, and a small IVC. And finally, the last piece of the puzzle is evaluating the dark side, which is the systemic veins. It was a forgotten part of the circulation for many years, and now luckily we are back uh, looking into that, and we have a validated score by a team in Montreal looking at evaluating different uh, systemic venous uh, uh, parameters, starting with the inferior vena cava, the hepatic vein, the portal vein, and the renal vein using color Doppler and pulsed wave Doppler, and these are the different patterns of flow that you could see, which together could quantify systemic venous congestion. The hepatic vein should be predominantly anti-grade with systolic flow more than diastolic flow. And if you have systolic reversal of flow, that indicates high left atrial pressure. And portal vein normally should be non-pulsatile with increased pulsatility of portal vein that indicates congestion. And renal vein has the same, and here it sits below the base line with the renal artery above the baseline. Pulsatility of the renal vein is similar to portal vein because it indicates congestion. And having these normal or mildly abnormal or severely abnormal parameters together can quantify congestion at the bedside. And we find this extremely helpful in managing hemodynamic conditions, guiding diuretic therapy, and guiding fluid administration because these provide a tool to tell us when to stop giving fluids before it becomes too late and patients develop uncontrollable fluid overload, which is clearly linked to increased morbidity and mortality. And when we combine all these parameters together, and this is a, an algorithm that we proposed uh, uh, recently, we could use uh, uh, echocardiography, systemic venous congestion, and lung ultrasound together to evaluate different types of shock, starting from vasoplegic obstructive cardiogenic and hypovolemic shock. So my final uh, take home message, I believe that echo assessment in shock is complex. However, it is very useful 
and feasible and understanding the complexity uh, enable us to perform it safely at the bedside to guide the best management for our patients. And it's complex because as we know uh, in intensive care, it requires understanding of physiology and hemodynamics, especially when it comes to ECMO and mechanical support, the management changes and the understanding changes. And it's very important to remember the role of heart-lung interactions, which play a key role in the assessment of shock. And I always advocate for the multimodal approach, utilizing echocardiography, lung ultrasound, and venous ultrasound together. And finally, this is an evolving field. So we are working and looking uh, and hoping for uh, a further research and validation in the near future. And thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Weil, thank you very much. This is a fantastic question. Uh, actually, I didn't mention that for the sake of time, but it's very crucial while we measure LVOTVTI that we are aware of the pitfalls. First of all, the flow has to be laminar. So when we obtain LVOTVTI, we have to make sure the position of the sample volume is in the right place, which is five millimeter below the valve. And also the view itself have to be, has to be optimum. We always say the most important thing in echocardiography is obtaining adequate views. Because if the view is off axis, the measurement will not be accurate. So try to get the best views. Pulsed wave Doppler, five millimeter below the valve. And then uh, you have to obtain the laminar flow where it is white, peripherally and dark in the middle. And you should see a closing click after the flow, and you should not see an opening click before the flow. And that confirms that you are at the LVOT. And once you are sure that you have the right LVOT envelope by having these criteria, you start tracing the dense modal velocity of the envelope, and which is described by the guidelines as the chin and not the beard of the envelope. And that way, I think we are able to estimate the LVOT VTI more precisely at the bedside. So, so uh, inferior, inferior vena cava, uh, uh, actually, actually the, the, the new understanding, understanding of the inferior vena cava is that it is, it is usually, usually not, not always a cylindrical uh, 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 structure, because, because when, when the IVC is empty, it becomes, becomes elliptical, not, not rounded. rounded. So, if so if you do, you do it in the long axis, axis you, can you can overestimate the diameter of the, of the, of the IVC, because, because it could be an ellipse and you are measuring in the long diameter. So the, so the best, best way recommended, recommended now to measure the IVC is in the short axis, axis position. And, and I, I prefer to do it from the mid axillary position. position. So, so once I obtain the IVC in the, in the transhepatic window, I rotate the probe 90 degrees. degrees so, so the indicator becomes, becomes facing uh, uh, anteriorly. anteriorly and, then and then I get the short axis, axis of the IVC and I measure the two different uh, axes, axes of the IVC, the, the long and the, and the short, and then, and then take the average, average diameter of the IVC. I think, I think this, this is the best way to not overestimate the diameter of the IVC by doing it only in the long axis. axis. Regarding, Regarding the fluid status, IVC is not enough to tell me about fluid status. Although, Although it is more reliable to rule out uh, um, uh, uh, hypovolemia. For, for example, if you have a patient who has dilated IVC, they are unlikely to be hypovolemic. But, but it is not useful to rule in congestion because, because you can, can have dilated IVC without congestion. congestion. And, that's and that's why the importance of the VEXIS protocol that I showed, which provides further information with the IVC to evaluate congestion, uh, uh, looking at the hepatic vein, portal vein and renal vein in case of dilated IVC. What about the treatment? Will it be obstruction in hypovolemic or, or something? Yeah, yeah, this, this is, is a very, very important point, point uh, and I, I absolutely, absolutely, and we see it very, very frequently and uh, dramatically, it dramatically changes the management. The management. Once, Once you identify LVOT obstruction, assuming, assuming it's a dynamic obstruction, not a fixed, because, because if, if it's a fixed obstruction like hokum, it needs uh, some, some sort of intervention or surgery. But if, but if it's, it's dynamic obstruction, obstruction the, type the type of obstruction we see frequently after cardiac surgery, then, then the treatment has to be working on relieving the obstruction by increasing the end systolic volume of the left ventricle. And that can be achieved by giving fluids, by increasing the afterload with vasopressors, by stopping or reducing inotropes, by reducing the heart rate, whether by beta blockers, if the patient could tolerate beta blockers, or by reducing the rate uh, via the pacemaker. Thank you very much, Dr. Hadden. Any question? Thank you very much, Dr. Hadden.